We are back from the weekend. It's Monday. I trust you had a wonderful weekend. We are back with the issues. It's Monday. Welcome to the polls on Joy News. Joy News, independent, fearless, and credible. So coming up in this afternoon's edition, players in Ghana's power industry are racing against time to stabilize power supply. This afternoon, we focus on the roadmap to a solution as Parliament's Mines and Energy Committee suggests the activities of the players to scrutiny in a quest to stabilize power supply in the country. Meanwhile, Ghanaians continue to bear the brunt of the outages. We share the experiences of printing business in our Doomso series. Also this afternoon, Chief Justice Gertrude Tokonu says the judiciary must make itself more accountable to the people as she delivers her vision statement as head of the judiciary. We have reaction from political parties who are always divided on how the courts operate on political matters. And of course later, National Association of Institutional Suppliers suspend picketing activities at the Ministry of Education following a closed-door meeting with the ministry officials and assurance of payment of money owed them. And of course, the post is brought to you by Global Communities Digilu, affordable, safe and sanitation for all. We are live on Channel 421 on DSTV and GoTV125. Follow us on Facebook, YouTube and my journal online for these and more. My name is Elton Robbie. Welcome to the polls here on Joy News with me, Elton Brobe. Let's start from the energy sector because the Ghana Grid Company Limited and the Voter River Authority are under scrutiny by the Parliament's Committee on Mines and Energy. This exercise is conducted periodically to assess and review the performance and plans of sector players in a power value chain to ensure stable power supply in the country. We'll hear from the chairman of the Mines and Energy Committee in Parliament, an exclusive interview following today's meeting with Gridco and VRA. We also get to speak to former Power Minister, Member of Parliament for Pru East, Dr. Kamala Donko, who will join us in the studio. First though, let's tell you what we know so far about the power situation in the country. And this is what uh, we do understand the, the, the challenges for supply challenges. And there's also the issue of plant maintenance. These are some of the uh, the, 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 the explanations that were preferred uh, before this meeting. And of course, we also do understand the level of indebtedness in the power sector currently, as we speak, around 1.2 billion uh, US dollars or more than that projected cost of fuel for 2024. That's how much we're required to procure fuel to power our power generation plants to ensure reliable power supply. And that stands at 1.2 billion United States dollars. And of course, calls of doing so reviewed outlook for March 27 to April. I mean, we brought you this yesterday. The uh, total capacity installed is 5,626 megawatts. And currently, we are doing 3,251, giving a deficit of 2,375. That's the reason why sometimes you sleep in darkness or when you wake up in the morning, you have no power to undertake your normal activities. These are the, the, this, this is the reason, and of course, unavailability of generated capacity, reason for unavailability. There's maintenance, which has resulted in 740 uh, megas of power. There's inadequate for supply. There are also faults that, that need to be rectified. So total, you have some 1.455 megas of power out of the national stream. The reason why we have done so, if you like. So we have been looking at the impact the power situation is, is having on you and, of course, your businesses. My colleague, Kenneth Jesse, he's been speaking to business owners in, this, in the news print enclave for our Doomsaw Diaries. Take a, take a uh, watch this. This building houses a cluster of printing shops. On a regular working day, they print everything from receipts, brochures, to calendars. But these days, they print almost nothing. This shop has a minimum of four workers. 
But now, barely two employees show up at work. The reason? Intermittent power supply, popularly known as Dumso. This job requires uninterrupted electricity supply to function. But with the recent power outages, the shop has been rendered redundant. When the people bring their jobs here like this, they want it fast. So you don't have any reason to delay them. But since Monday up to now, we don't have light here. So all the work that they brought, they have to take them back. So at the end of the day, you spend money to, for transport, you come and sit down here, you, you have to eat. You know, as for stomach, it doesn't know whether you are working or not. So you come, you eat, and you go back home. So it's not helping us at all. The business itself was down because most of the things are being printed from China now. Okay, so the small stuff that we are getting here, we've just done so, everything is now zero. For some time now, we've been having this on and off, on and off, this uh, light out. And moreover, the business is not booming as it's, uh, it used to. So the little that, you know, we have that we have to do, when the light goes off, then maybe the client also feels like he needs to deliver the job uh, the same day. So when the lights go off like this, sometimes we try to persuade them to give us, let's say, uh, some hours, maybe a day. But most of the time, some, uh, it fails us. Because we normally tell them they should give us a time, they will go. By the time they will come back, the lights are still not uh, back. Then you realize that they will just come and carry the, the job away. Just like most Guineans, these workers are calling for a timetable. They say a load shedding timetable will help them plan their work schedule so they are able to meet clients' deadlines and do not lose contracts due to unexpected power outages. So I think that should be the best way. Because if I know that today, Tuesday, I won't be having light here, I won't bother myself to take a car from a fireplace and come and sit down, just to come and sit down here. I will have prepared or organized myself better for it. If I know I will be having a work to do, maybe in the night, I will arrange myself to come and do it in the night. So by the morning, when the light is off, then I will go and rest. So the timetable is very necessary to be very helpful. Oh, how about the timetable? You need a timetable to schedule our this thing. If there is time to, we know that tomorrow there is no light. We can just stay home and manage. Maybe the money we use it to take care. We can manage it, and the next day, you know that the next day, the light will be will come. But do they have a standby generator that will at least keep their business running in the event of Dumso? I asked. Yeah, actually, we're having one. Uh, since for some time when the Dumso the the lights came to uh, stability. Yeah, we actually took the generator away because we don't have space here. And where the generator is, the children, most of the times, they normally play around, set fire and so on. So the other time it was about to, you know, catch fire. So my boss took it away, uh, thinking maybe now the lights are stable. Four stores away is another shop that performs a similar function. Not as big as the previous one, but of equal importance. This is where they stitch the books and other printed materials before they are sent to their destinations. But the recent power outages mean they will have to sometimes stitch the books manually. We are using this machine for the stitching. You used to stitch this book. If there is one, you can't use it. Yesterday, they made light off around dawn, 435 that way. Light came around 12 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, sometimes you can't work. This one is printed. If there is no light, you can't print. After printing, they'll bring it to you. Here is the finishing side. Um, if there is no light, there is nothing going on. So, the last time I came here, I saw a number of people, but today you are the only person. And because of the light was since yesterday, this afternoon, 12 o'clock before the light came, because of that, they are now... Oh, yes.
the impact of intermittent power outages on these businesses has been dire. Some staff have been told to stay home for the time being. The rest that show up either sleep, read a book, or engage in an activity or two to while away time. Kenneth, Jesse, for Joy News. So, following today's meeting between the Mines and Energy Committee of Parliament and the Voter River Authority and Gridco, my colleague Samuel Mbura spoke exclusively with the chairman of the committee ahead of that interview. Let's hear from Samuel on what transpired at the meeting. Samuel Mbura is here with me in the studio. So, Samuel, let's start from Saturday yeah. and then uh, Sunday and then today. Yeah. What transpired? Following concerns as captured in the report by our colleague, Kenneth Jesse, about uh, the impact this doom saw is having on businesses, uh, Parliament had to set the committee, that's a Mines and Energy Committee, to look into it to find out what exactly is causing the situation. So Saturday, they had to summon all the industry players from the generators, that's the VRA, distributors, grid co, suppliers, ECG, the regulators, that's the Energy Commission, as right. well as the PURC. So all of these sector players, um, the Ghana Gas and all those who matter, so far as our, our power system is concerned, appeared before the committee. So the main objective of the committee was to find out what the actuality is on the ground, because we have been getting conflicting reports. They say it is the issue of generation, others are saying it's the issue of supply and all that. So uh, in their probe, and I must state on record that when all these uh, stakeholders appear before the committee, we know it is a standard practice that when you appear before the parliament select committee, you must swear an oath. So right. they actually spoke on oath and confirmed that they have, um, they have um, experienced uh, issues of, um, what do you call it, um, under production right. of um, uh, wow. power. That's why we have the situation. This interview, I had an interview with uh, John Janapo, who told me about the fact that these industry players spoke under oath and also they confirmed to the committee that there's a shortfall in the production and generation of power, a reason we are having this concern. That's okay. where the committee chaired by Samuel Athachia said that it was non-negotiable for them to direct the ECG to issue a timetable with immediacy, even though a time frame has not been given so that Ghanaians can plan their life. And, 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 and let's hear the response before we hear from uh, Samuel Athachia and the chairman of the Mines Energy Committee. Let's hear what the managing director of ECG, what is his description yeah. of the situation we're experiencing today? Well, when I contacted him, I asked him about the fact that Ghanaians are raising concerns about they not being able to plan their life because of the constant tripping off the, the lights and all that. And what he insisted was that there's no load shedding at all. What we are seeing is that they are doing, they are continuing the maintenance and that's why we are having this. So I, I posed that direct question to him. Are we shedding load? And he said, no, they are not shedding load. Despite the uh, confirmation given to the committee that there's ongoing load shedding. We can hear from the ECG managing director. Yes, the lights are going to stay on. Most of the transformers that we spoke about and the intensification exercises are almost done, so we should just stay positive. There will be a proper statement as to the way forward. Very are you shedding load? We are currently not shedding load, so we are not shedding load. Thank you. So well, now the, the, meeting, the meeting's over. Uh, what is the takeaway from the meeting from the perspective of the chair of the Mines and Energy Committee? So Mr. Atachia is assuring the public that they would look into the matter and ensure that all the bottlenecks are sealed. They will reach out to the Ministry of Finance because they have now been able to identify that it is a financial problem. So all the outstanding debt will be cleared and the ECG issuing a statement for us. But the ultimate assurance is that this issue is not going to persist for long. Although he accepts that it is a scientific problem, engineers are working around the corner to uh, ensure that we have constant power supply. But uh, the ultimate goal of the committee is not just to deal with the odd issue that we have at hand, but in the long run, deal with the power crisis in its entirety. Well, the other agencies like we just completed with Greco, is telling us their work program. You know, Greco is a very strategic um, a stakeholder in uh, power transmission. So we have the generators, those who generate the power, and they transmit the power. So we need to look at some of their issues and also get a better understanding as to the transmission system and how it operates. 
what has transpired today, which is very interesting, is that um, um, they cannot, if you like, tweak the supply of uh, electri electricity. You see, they don't have a power to sort of um, um, sabotage the flow. The, the flow is, is scientific and technologically driven. So when there is excess which has a potential of blowing the system, the system will do some correction. And then uh, the loading is done and the shutting is done. If you are not careful and you have more than the system can contain, it can blow uh, it all. So this is what they are doing, which is to say that they do not have the capacity to shortchange the uh, electricity company of Ghana in terms of the power they deliver to them. Since it is scientific, should, should we be worried as consumers that uh, we may not know when this issue will be fixed? No, we, no, because there are engineers who are running the system, so we shouldn't worry about it at all. And what it is that they have even done backups to ensure that uh, the system does not degenerate. What we have to be concerned is that uh, we have sufficient um, 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 fuel driving the plants. And all the plants that are doing maintenance should up their game with the maintenance. So they operate at full throttle and generate more power. When they generate more power, grid coal will transmit the power and then ECG will receive the power and then we get good power supply. Some of the problems that ECG might be going through, which you know already, are the uh, transmission losses. You know, and also peop uh, individuals um, uh, who um, with respect, would want to enjoy power without paying. So that it's been found that the revenue loss to ECG is about 30%. There is no setup in the world in which you lose 30% of your revenue, you know, and function well. So these are the, the loopholes that have to be plugged. And the minister is very, 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 very strong on the matter. And I'm sure we'll be able to nip it in the bud. Even the issue of uh, meters. You know, if you have prepaid meters and the rest of it, they are involved in the private sector so that any, any household will have their prepaid meters. And then when you consume, uh, you buy the electricity upfront, then you can consume it. Chairman, what's the financial situation in the energy sector? Um, do we have enough money to clear our debts? Is there any processes underway to clear the debt? Well, whatever it is, I can assure you that because power is critical to the whole economy, money should be found by. Uh, even the Minister of Finance, to if there's any um, uh, shortfall in funds so that we can um, uh, generate enough power, that should be found. You see, because you can't have it both ways. If you don't want to find the money to generate the power, you don't have power, and you need power to propel the economy, and it's cyclical. You come back to square one. It's a vicious cycle you should avoid. And that is how it's going to be. The only thing which is very critical is that let's aid ECG to, to plug in the loopholes. So ECG will generate a lot of money and then it comes to the cash waterfall and those who have contributed in generating power will be paid. And then it goes on like that. If there is under recovery of revenue, they will not be able to meet the obligations they owe to the power generators and Greco by extension. So this is how the situation is all like. So, Honourable, the meeting of the committee ends today, right? After that, what, what happens? Well, we will have to come out with a communique, I mean, as to the way forward. And then we monitor everybody who is in the value chain that we achieve what we, we, we are all looking for and end to power outages. We come back to the glorious seven years of President Kufuado in which we didn't have these uh, power outages. I don't, I, it shouldn't happen. He's been very, very, very good in trying to generate power for, for seven years. We see, his, we see it as a, a mess for anybody to try to say that, oh, at the closing chapter of his reign as president, there should be power challenges. But what we're going through is a temporal one. It doesn't measure up to what we experienced some three years of, I mean, doom so. I think earlier you were telling me that there's good news. This issue is not going to persist for long. But what you have heard from them, what is the assurance? What is the situation on the ground now? The situation on our ground is that we need to generate more power and everything which is requisite for power to be generated will be generated and then to be transmitted. ECG will have a lot of power to sell. At the same time, we're whipping ECG to 
make sure that it doesn't lose 30 percent of its revenue and then if we're able to plug the loopholes i mean it will be good for us so no, but we know obviously the challenge is financial how are you going to hold the finance ministry specifically to make funds immediately available to plug all these loopholes you're talking about the president is concerned that we should have the good old days 70 years of power and he's going to do everything to ensure that he and his finance minister will raise the requisite monies for us to have power how much do we need i don't have the numbers and 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 i don't want to sort of uh, <laughs> uh i mean sort of speculate the kind of money they need but whatever the money they need those who are crying for the money they know and i think they know the numbers no, no, I, we know that the committee is doing this in the interest of Ghanaians. And that's why you have stepped in. Ghanaians are watching us now. Tell them, per what you have heard from the generators, the distributors, and the suppliers, what should they not worry about? They shouldn't worry about like a permanent situation of power outages. In fact, I am acutely aware that the president is working seriously hard and will drive everybody to, to do what is needful so that in the final analysis, we go to the good old days of President Akufuado, 70 years that we didn't have any mess in terms of power. That is a legacy he wants to live, and I don't think he will mess it up. So how many entities more to uh, appear before the committee? Right now we have VRA, I mean, to, 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 uh, to come for us to look at what they are doing. Whatever um, entity we have today will be subsequent to what we are doing now. But the critical ones are the ones we've engaged. VR is last and we'll finish for the day. All right. And as the chairman of the Mines and Energy Committee, Samuel Atachian, explaining the outcome of their three-day meeting with players in the power sector, uh, Mr. Atachian is a lawyer and he leads the, finance, uh, the Mines and Energy Committee in Parliament. But in the studio is somebody who knows the in and out of the matter we are coming to discuss this after Dr. Governor Donko. He's a former power minister and also member of the Mines and Energy Committee. This is his area. And so he understands the issues much better. And so how are you also feeling that you can join us with your contribution via uh, our, our Facebook and YouTube pages with your comments and comments on being you to our viewers this afternoon. Dr. Donko, you're welcome to the post. Thank you. So, I mean, I've heard two things. Uh, before we get to what, you, what you've been told in the last three days, uh, Mr. Atachan says that in the last 70 years, they've managed to, uh, to ensure reliability in power supply. Uh, last week, there was a tweet from Gabi Asari who says that he was, he was surprised that the Akufuado government, despite COVID and all the economic uh, difficulties that the country has went to in the last seven years, managed to you know, ensure power supply. And he was unsure what really is happening right now. Seven years of power and then about to exit power, they are facing challenges. And some will look at it and say that they may be sabotaged somewhere. What is your response to this political angle to the matter before we get to the real issues? Well, I am quite surprised about this consistent claim that seven years of uninterrupted power. Mm. If viewers will recall the saying doom cc right it arose out of a certain situation if you tell the people of kumase for example that we've had seven years of uninterrupted power they would challenge to be charitable your assertion mm. we haven't had seven years of uninterrupted power but indeed, but, but it is worse now than yeah indeed when the media took on the minister, challenged the minister. He was trying to make a difference between what prevailed prior to 2016 and what was then happening last year and the year before. And so he labeled it doom CAC right. because there were outages. So let's not gloss over that. Mm. Currently, there is a challenge. Of course, the energy sector is a very dynamic sector. Today, you may not have outtake. Tomorrow, you will have it. It is for this reason that we have a reserve margin. Mm -hmm. Today, we have serious challenges with outages. If you take yesterday, mm -hmm. for example, somebody will say, oh, there's no outage yesterday, apart from localized falls. Mm -hmm. But that will be 
papering over the crack. Because localite foil is also outage. It, well, even to, but there was low shedding yesterday, except that the burden of the low shedding was put on our neighboring countries at a point we were exporting zero to one of our neighboring countries. Mm -hmm. And it's, it has such dangerous implications for the welfare of the energy uh, sector and even for Ghanaians as a people. For example, Ouagadougou, mm -hmm. the capital of Burkina Faso, other than solar, is totally dependent on power from Ghana. 100%. 100%. If you give uh, Burkina Faso, Sonabel, zero, whether peak or off peak, mm. it means they are in darkness. Yeah, you are plunging the whole, yes. the, the capital of the of Burkina Faso, of, of Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso into darkness. It has both economic and security implications. Mm -hmm as well as even strategic implications. Let's take the strategic implication first. If I were Burkina Bay, or I was in the leadership of Burkina Bay, one, of, one I would say is supply from Ghana is unreliable. Why don't you look for alternate sources? And the alternate sources could be building more dams, mini dams in Burkina. Mm -hmm. Remember, the voter takes a source outside Ghana. Right. So if they begin to build more dams, it will affect, it will the affect of Bodam. our generation. So we must always have that in mind. But uh, they, Doctor, is that what is happening now that we are curtailing power to we did. our neighboring countries? We did. We are curtailing. So, so therefore, the present directive is now in force. Well, the interesting thing is that the Ministry of Energy says on record it has not received that directive. VRA, mm -hmm. obviously, an agency under the ministry says it has not. However, there are some other claims in the public domain that, that such a directive was issued. Right. And yesterday, as I stated, the export to a particular country was zero at a certain period, which means whether by default or by design, that a directive is being implemented. And it was so short-sighted. Okay, in order to boost domestic supply let's breach our contractual obligations but wouldn't that come with implications absolutely and that was why i was saying that it has economic as well as security implications right the economic implication is that both vra and gridco have to go out of ghana to seek finance mm -hmm. to finance projects these projects are financed on the basis of their forex inflows. Because of the power we export, they receive for, uh, payment in foreign exchange. Right. So this serves to finance the debt capital. And therefore, if this ceases, we'll be in default. And once in terms of pay, paying the, payment, the loan. Yes. Once we get into default, the implication is that in future, it's going to be so difficult uh, coming up with new projects to es expand and to stabilize the grid. Mm. So it is very short-sighted. Whoever, the advisors advising His Excellency the President on this are not doing that in the national interest. They are doing that in, in the interest of temporal political gain that is counter to the national But doctor, correct me if I'm wrong, but the information we have is that the total power we export is around 250 megawatts compared to the deficit. It's above that. It's above that. It's, it's about 250 megawatts. Yes. You uh, see, for the last three months, arising out of this load shedding, we have also shared some exports. Mm. That is acceptable. We have shared some export. But if we are to stop export totally, first one, they will be looking for alternative supply mm. routes. So in future, they cannot rely on Precisely. you for power supply. A good example is that Nigeria can supply some of these countries. Nigeria supplies about six cents per kilowatt hour. Ghana is exporting around 10 cents. They prefer supply from Ghana because it's stable. Mm. So if we lose that brand advantage, we are no longer going to have that. And the way things are going, it is possible we may lose it. Yes, if, we, if like we continue they, they, with this, um, and this directive, uh, uh, let me be careful mm -hmm. with my choice of words. This directive that is misinformed mm -hmm. in terms of the national interest, um, 
we will lose that. Fortunately for me, as I sit here, uh, as a student of energy policy, right. I see an attempt at reversal. Once the ministry says it is not aware of, 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 the, directive. of the directive, and VR also says they have not received, there is a certain rethink uh, around the whole area. Around the whole area, and so uh, it's a retreat. But after, what does this tell of our strategy to address this matter head on? We have, we have internal issues. We have home challenges. Yes. And yet, exporting power appears to, appears to be one of the solutions we are considering. That it tells you that we are, we are not really fixing the, the core of the challenge that that, that, that faces. Yeah, there are a number of challenges causing it. But for example, um, VRA spends a minimum of $30 million a month paying for gas supply. Mm -hmm. A minimum. $30 million. Yes, a minimum. Gas supply from Nigeria and gas. Annually, monthly? Or? Monthly. Okay. A minimum. VRA has to finance this uh, purchase. They finance this from the export revenue. Mm. And therefore, if we take away the export revenue, they are not going to finance this from cities. In any case, for export revenue, uh, we get total payment mm. and payment on time. For domestic supply, we are in deficit because we are totally under recovering cost. V, uh, ECG, both ECG and NETCO are unable to collect what they have to collect. Take away technical losses. Which but, is 30% as we have been told. Uh, that is a combination of technical and commercial. Mm. But at least if you give them 11% technical losses, it means we are unable to uh, account for 19% of what we duly bill. Mm. That is account for it. Then pay, actual payment is even different from accounting for it. And the, and, 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 and the reason is that what people take the power and they don't pay? Pe one, people steal power. And there's no other charitable way to use. Mm. People, and when I say people, inclu this includes companies. Because some companies, factories have been caught stealing power. Mm. That is one. Two, so our collection, methods of collection are so inefficient. Three, there are meters that are not working. So people are consuming power. They are not stealing, but they are not being built. Uh, yes, and, and, and that is ECG's issue. Yes. And then four, there are those who have been built and have not paid. And so in recent times, ECG has had to cut off power to entities that are owing. Including state-owned enterprises. Including state-owned in fact, they did to Parliament, and I was very pleased about that. <laughs> okay, so now let's talk about what, what you were told at, that, at, at this meeting. You met ECG. What is ECG's challenge? Well, ECG's challenge, uh, basically, one is supply. They, they are, are not getting it in their supply. They are not receiving enough power mm -hmm. to distribute. That was established. They are not receiving enough. Yes, they may have some operational challenges, a few transformers. For example, if you say 630 transformers are overloaded and you are working on that, and man, you are, we are told largely all of them have been fixed, mm -hmm. largely. The 630 looks huge in isolation. But if you consider the fact that ECG has over 32,000 transformers, that it makes the 600 very insignificant. Insignificant. And the 600 cannot have the impact that you and I are feeling. Mm. So it's, it's been established that there's a supply shortfall mm. because we, don't, we are not generating enough. And that is the, the issue with Gridco the, and VRE. Yes. No, Gridco does not come in. Right. Gridco is a kayaye. Mm. You give me five yams to, take, to deliver to a buyer in the market, I carry the five yams. Mm -hmm. It is only when I fall and one yam breaks that I am accountable. But as long as I deliver the five yams, I am not accountable. So we have VR, we have independent power producers. Yes. What is IPPs mm -hmm. and VRE, mm -hmm. they are the generators. Mm -hmm. So this whole attempt to shift the blame to Gridco is one unscientific 
and too misplaced. Mm. So again, let, let, let's look at the IPPs and VRA. Gas is gas and inability to procure fuel. The only challenge, the no. reason why we are in darkness? No. Uh, there is a challenge with some of the plants, actual generation. Yes, I will, in my estimation, 70% of the problem will have been fuel, fuel uh, driven. Mm. But there's also the 30%. A number of plants are out um, of, they are not generating because some are on plant maintenance, others are on, on plant maintenance, etc. So plant availability is also a question. Mm. But it is for this reason that we have a reserve margin. Right. So if all things were working right, one, two, three plants going down, particularly <laughs> in a year where we have had excess rainfall, and therefore the reservoir is more than um, excellent. Because so they, they are ramping up Akosumo to about 900 megawatts. And it is, I haven't seen that in a very long time. But it's because we have, the reservoir is very uh, good. So we should not have this. So we need to fix, we need to be candid with the Ghanaian people. Look, uh, nation, we have a challenge. Mm. One, we are under recovering cost. And for any business, if you are putting in more than you are taking out in terms of revenue, ultimately it will impact on you. Your working capital will diminish and your ability to buy the consumables, such the fuel and the rest that you need. So, so, so therefore, compromised. government cannot continually push money into the sector, and yet the returns doesn't even make up for how much was invested. Yeah, it's not just government, the Ghanaian people, because yes, government is uh, supporting fuel pitches by about 200 to 250 uh, million CDs a month. Mm. Government has to do this because largely we are under recovery. And when you, you are, we are under recovering, then the state has to step in. But this is money that ought to have gone into chief's compound. This and is the, money and that... And now going to the power sector. Yes, this is money that ought to have gone to education. This is money that ought to have gone into agriculture, into internal security, mm. etc. So it's going to power sector. If the sector was efficient, but the waste in the sector and the inefficiencies in the sector mm -hmm. makes it impossible to even recoup the money that is going in. That is going into it. But there is also a responsibility of government. To be fair, the macroeconomy, particularly monetary policy, mm. it is managed by government. Either Ministry of Finance or the Bank of Ghana. Mm. When you have your currency deteriorating at the rate at which it has deteriorated in the last year, it's going to have impact on your prices, particularly in a sector, as I consistently say, mm -hmm. where your payables are dollar denominated. Right. We pay for the fuel in dollars. We pay the IPP in dollars. We bring in parts in dollars. Mm. And yet our receivables are in cities. And so when there is such a deterioration mm. arising out of mismanagement of the macroeconomy, the government cannot escape blame. But, but again, if we want to look at the role of ECG in this, did you get the impression that they are working hard to reduce the inefficiencies from their own part? Well, let's be fair, it is not only ECG. Um, ECG, NETCO. Netco covers about 64 percent of the land mass of Ghana. And I was going to ask you whether the, whether the doom so is also being experienced as it is experienced. Absolutely. In, in fact, it's in your part, which is under the control of VRN. It's, it's worse in my constituency than it is in Accra. Okay. Yeah. So let's deal with the inefficiencies yes. and whether you get so the assurance that they are working to deal with it. Yeah. The, there are inefficiencies. There are those inefficiencies which arise out of managerial lapses. Mm -hmm. Those we will have to push and push and reduce them. 
Unfortunately, as I have said, too many decisions in the Ghanaian space are procurement driven. We'll have to tackle that. But there are also those inefficiencies that, uh, which arise out of a failure to inject capital. Mm. And that we cannot hold the utilities alone responsible. Shareholders must inject capital, mm. especially when it comes to equipment. For example, um, as we speak, Gridco owes VRA. Even though it doesn't buy from VRA. Mm. It owes VRA because it's been contracted to, uh, let, for the sake of, let me use layman's term so that it has been contracted to carry load from VRA to ECG, ECG and to Netco. Then, along the way, part of the load is missing, mm. which we call transmission losses. Right. And so, by contract, VRA will bill Greco. You charge me to carry this from Accra to Kumasi. It gets to Kumasi and there's a shortage, so you pay for it. So Greco, as we speak, owes VRA. Like, by, by how much are you, aware, are you aware of this figure? In excess of 100 million CDs. Okay. In excess. I'm just being conservative. And this as a result of transmission losses. Precisely. But Gridco can cure this by injection of capital in the form of better equipment, mm. expanding their transmission cap capacity. Uh, for example, moving a lot from 161 to 330 kV lines, etc. But that needs money. Right. So there, yes, yeah, there is part of the inefficiency that needs to be addressed through capital injection, through finance. But, but doctor, the issue about the efficiency on the part of ECG, if they are able to deal with this matter, the, the, the outcome will be that the, 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 the cash waterfall mechanism, the details of it will be, will be respected. Yeah, it will be better populated. Mm -hmm. Because as you get more efficient, you get more revenue. Exactly. So the cash waterfall mechanism will be better populated. What is the state of it as we speak? Well, PRC, for the, for the, for the month e, of March. ECG is misbehaving in terms of yeah, for the, the distribution of the cash yes, to the players. For the month of March, ECG has started complying. Mm. At, and the results show. Okay. So hopefully that compliance will continue. But we have real issues in the sector. Tell me about them. One is the debt stockpiling. Currently stands as over what? The debt in the energy sector? Yes. Over, over, over 1.4 or 6 billion about dollars? About 1.5 billion dollars mm -hmm. and growing. That is the, the worry. For example, if you take payment to IPPs, there's been an arrangement to restructure. So ECG is virtually guaranteeing $43 million every month payment. The $43 million does not cover all of the invoices. Mm. They have agreed to restructure the rest for another four years, yeah. which means the next government, and this is monthly, right? which means the next government will not just inherit the $1.5 billion as we know today, but every month will also inherit. Because there's always a carryover. There's every a carryover. Month. So my biggest worry is the de debt stockpile for the next government. And that, and, gives, and that gives the indication that this on and off light situation is not going to be resolved anytime soon. Well... It can be resolved, but at the expense of some other projects and some other programs, if it's a fool. So first of all, we must tackle the question of collection, mm. and, and not just collection, even procurement, mm. seriously. We must have a plan to drive down costs. If you're running any business and your revenue is deteriorating, in real terms, the revenues are deteriorating, notwithstanding whatever adjustment PURC does. Mm. Because in dollar terms, yes. there's a deterioration of yes. revenue. Mm. So if you, or if you are not growing your revenue in, re, 
in real numbers, mm. then you have to look at your cost. How do we drive down cost? Did you, did you, did you direct ECG to publish a load management timetable? Uh, I don't speak for the committee. I am not in the leadership of the committee, mm. so I am very careful. I was asking whether such directions I, I, went I to I thought the I heard the chairman in your interview saying they that did. was that. Because the ECG, also from the same clip you heard from the ECG managing director, he makes the point that they, they are not sharing load, and for that reason, I think it may not be necessary. You, you see, if they said, it depends on the type of timetable. Such that if I, I, if, that's that I can plan yeah, my if life I had, and know that if I'll I be off today right. or have light tomorrow so that I can plan accordingly. If I had right, the position espoused by the chairman was that at least notification, you should be notified. Mm. It may not be a month's timetable, a timetable. If you're going to have uh, an outage in your area, in these days of technology, since payments are even being made via mobile phones, people in that captive area should be notified. Mm. Yes, there is the need for notification so that we can plan our lives. Um, if the ACG MD says there's no low shedding, today, this morning, it is possible that there's no low shedding in the ECG operational zone today mm. because we have shared a load of export with serious dire consequences on the political economy, not just on the macroeconomy, on the political economy. Right. If our neighboring countries believe we are sharing the benefit of the Volta Dam and our strategic positioning in the center of West Africa in terms of power with them, they are comfortable. Mm. If they begin to think we are being selfish, denying them, then they will start thinking of themselves. Of course, they need to. They need to. And that will so, be very important. But I just want to find out uh, the, 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 other, the, the, the other contribution to our power generation. And for example, Bui. Bui has been lost in this, in this conversation. And I know that Bui was set up as a peaking dam. Yes. And our load peak usually in the evening where Bui is expected to come on stream. What is the state of Bui now? Well, Bui, there was an overdrafting of Bui uh, late last year to now. Mm. So Bui's generation has to slow down, and it's slowing down. Because if it doesn't slow down, then the reservoir will run out. So Bui's contribution now, um, is, in terms of quantum, is going down. Mm. But Bui has a, a, a challenge. ECG is Bui's only off-taker. Mm. And when ECG is unable to pay, in fact, there have been months when Bui has had to take a bank overdraft to pay salaries. Because is, ECG was unable to pay them. Pay them. Or they are paying them less than 40% of their invoice prices. And so there bigger problem of liquidity, of finance, of cash would have to be looked at far more seriously than, than we are doing. You, you have been in a position of authority in terms of our power sector before. And is it the case that as a country we have failed to plan ahead of time that we've been exposed because of uh, our inability to procure fuel and because some of the plans are out of service. Is there lack of planning on the part of successive governments? We have been too complacent. As a people, I won't even say as government, we have always seen power as a social right, rather as an, an economic good. When we see power as an economic good, then the question of cost recovery, the question of efficiency of use, even in our homes, mm. and that is why I say, as a people, if we see that, then we treat power and power-related issues as business. Mm. Unfortunately, we have treated power as a public good. And it's become a political tool too. And it's become a political tool. And so we will have to take a second look. 
this country cannot develop without power. Indeed, for us as NDC, the power situation is so critical to the success of our 24-hour economy. Mm. It's so critical. And my hope and my prayer is that by the grace of God, the next government should be NDC, but that that government must address the power issue as the number one priority mm. above all else. Even though there, there, there are bigger challenges waiting for the next government in 2025 in the power sector. Precise, the debt stock, stockpile. Right. Remember, a number of these restructuring, haircuts and all the rest, will kick in in the next four years. Yes. So there is already that. And this, this is, the debt sto uh, stockpile is far, far more serious than what President Kufuor did to President Atamels. Uh, signing the single spine, mm. but Failing to leaving it reason. to be implemented mm. by the next government. Mm. It's going to be such a Herculean thing, the dog st stockpile. Mm. So Ghana is going to need a lot of international goodwill to further restructure that debt. Other than that, there will be no fiscal space whatsoever for anything. So it is important that we are aware that we are digging a pit for irrespective of which pa party wins the 2024 election. My prayer and my belief is that it's the NDC, mm -hmm. but irrespective of who wins, um, the challenges ahead mm -hmm. will, will be, be clearly. But, 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 but for the immediacy, and for those who are, who are watching us, and they're about to leave their offices and head home, and then the expectation is that they will go and meet light or electricity, for the immediacy, from now to, let's say, for the next two months, what should be government's role? What should be the power, the power player's role to ensure that we have some semblance of reliability in our power supply? Well, the players and the ministry, to an extent, alluded to the fact that they think within a month, this will be resolved. This will be resolved. From where you sit as an expert in this area, is it feasible? No, I'm a student of energy policy. <laughs> I don't like the word expert and how it is used in this country. I'm a student of energy policy. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be very challenging to meet that. It's ambitious. Ho let's hope they are able to do it. Because the finance crisis, the finance crisis, the money to buy fuel, and this will have been far worse than it is, but for the fact that we have some domestic, about 70, 80% of our natural gas is domestic. Mm. If we had a previous situation where 100% was important, the, the low shedding would have been worse than we've ever had. Mm. Thank God, because of the work done by previous administrations, we have domestic gas, mm. but even the 20 to 30% that we have to pay for is a challenge. Mind you, even with the domestic gas, ENI gas, government has had to pay for it. Right. So the financial health of the energy sector, um, at best, I would say it's in intensive care. Mm. Which may not be resolved in a month, as promised by no, the and, government. No, and, unless... unless there is a huge diversion of funds from other places in the budget just to buy fuel. All right. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Dr. Yeah. Kwabana Donko is a member of the Mines and Energy Committee, former power minister, and a member of parliament for Pu East in the Buni East region of the Republic. We will take a short break. When we return, Chief Justice Getu Tokono is pledging to rid the judiciary of corrupt elements. We have that and more coming your way. This is the pause with me, Elton Brobe. Welcome back to the polls here on Joy News. Now, let me take you to the judiciary arena because Chief Justice Getri Tokono is pledging to raid the judiciary of corrupt elements. The Chief Justice, in a real public event, to outline what he says is a vision for the judiciary, says there are certain unknown faces who engage in corruption in the name of the judiciary. 
I deeply crave, along with all well wishes, I'm sure, to change the tag of corruption, ineptitude, and inefficiency around the neck of the Judiciary and Judicial Service of Ghana. We cannot do this without the support and attention of all stakeholders. The Bangalore principles of judicial conduct and the Latimer House principles are international instruments that Ghana's judiciary are committed to. In order to shake off these tax, trading needs to be supplemented with consistent culture-changing strat strategies to deepen ethical models of work in the courts. Judicial administration must close the gaps through which court users are subjected to exploitation and rent-seeking behavior. This demands the removal of as much of the human interfacing that court work is exposed to. Court officials are expected to work with independence, with impartiality, competence, and integrity. Much of these ethical values are lost in the heavy traffic of human interfacing between court officials and court users, including unknown brokers functioning around the courts. The vision for producing culture-changing reorientation programs cannot be achieved without the active participation, the active partnership and support of stakeholders, including communities of businesses and donors. The Chief Justice also says the judiciary will truly digitalize under her watch, insisting she will do all she can to revolutionize the way land cases, which sometimes drag for years, are expeditiously dealt with. There is a need for the judiciary to make itself accountable by increasing transparency in the process and output of our judgments and decisions through real-time publications of decisions, especially when it comes to decisions on land ownership and other areas of law that affect the economy and social stability of the country. The judiciary is not known for speaking outside the corridors of the courts. And so it will not surprise me if many find this morning's event a bit odd. However, I have taken the step of doing so because as Albert Einstein is quoted as saying, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. What is causing so much litigation over land? When land is the most effective source of equity and capital for prosperity and business. Could the high cost of doing business in Ghana be related to the incessant litigation over land? How are we affecting the peace index of the nation through this high volume of land litigation? What must we all do differently? As administrator of justice, on behalf of the citizenry, I deem it my bounding duty to call for such conversations that will assist us all to break these high walls against the easy flow of capital and investments into our country because of the uncertainty of security of investment in landed property. So let's break it down. And Kweku Asante of our Legal Affairs Desk joins me with more from this, Francisco, you welcome. Yeah, thank you. So let's start with the Attorney General. Yes. He was there and had some strong words about some judges. In fact, yes, the Attorney General talks about how all, everyone in government wants to support the Chief Justice mm. with this. But he says there's been so much complaints about judges that he describes as inept. And this inept means they don't know what they are doing. Exactly. So he says this vision will not get to where it's supposed to get to 
If you don't deal with those elements who are still in the judiciary, listen to the Attorney General. You know, you see, Paul's encouraging you for this laudable initiative. May we remind ourselves that the greatest number of complaints about the justice delivery system in Ghana border on ineptitude of judges, attitude towards litigants and lawyers, as well as delays with the conclusion of cases. I'm of the fervent belief that your vision will result in a reduction of this phenomenon. Ultimately, in my respectful view, there also needs to be a rethinking of the exercise of the duration of the Supreme Court to ensure that the workload of the Supreme Court is manageable and conducive to efficiency. Drawing on the practice and experience in other situations in and outside the common law world, the Supreme Court ought to be able to, by recourse to the announcement of regulations governing the multiplicity of jurisdictions conferred on it, and within the constraints of the Constitution, restrict the number of cases it has, especially on appeals from the Court of Appeal to the Supreme Court. This will result in the delivery of more quality justice by the highest court of the land. I say that it is a digitized environment. I say that a digitized environment results in transparency, accountability, and efficiency in the public sector, and ultimately helps to eliminate and prevent corruption. The prospect of improved productivity and reduction of cost digitization brings requires that the judiciary embraces the same fully. I have no doubt that we will achieve a fully digitized environment in the tenor of a leadership a chief justice. Indeed, I see the era in which there will be the end. I see the era in which there will be the need for more virtual court houses easily accessible to all from any part of the world, rather than physical court houses constructed in communities and accessible to only a few, much closer than anticipated. The Attorney General, let's talk about the Vice President and the support he is extending. What exactly is he saying? Well, the Vice President has become the poster boy for digitalization when it comes to this government. Mm. And he says that he's had several conversations with the Chief Justice, who surely expressed her willingness to also digitalize the judiciary. There are so many courts you go and you are looking for a very simple document, they can't find it. Mm. The Chief Justice, in fact, in her own address, shows pictures of certain court registries where court documents are just strewn all over the floor. And so the Chief Justice uh, is getting the support of the Vice President, who is committing that the government is really keen on supporting this agenda of hers, and that whatever it is that government can do within its power to support the Chief Justice, deliver on this new vision that she set out in this address, government will do that. Justice is not about its trappings, but its utility. I am happy that the Honorable Lady Chief Justice, just like her predecessors, has answered this important call, and by doing so, is leading the third arm of the state to make the promise of our nation evident in the lives of our people and extend to all the protection that is theirs by birth. I note with great admiration and excitement the new impetus, focus, energy, and dynamism that her leadership has brought to the administration of justice since she took over the reins of office less than a year ago. It is this new zeal and sense of agency that has culminated in the vision that we are launching today, which would be the blueprint for her administration and point the way for the judiciary and the judicial service towards the goal that meets the justice demands of the 21st century and beyond. And Waku, I'm interested in the position of the Ghana Bar Association in this matter because mm. this vision can become reality if the Chief Justice gets the support of lawyers, lawyers. Uh, for example. Uh, so the GBA, yeah. what is their stand on this matter? Well, also, like you rightly stated, perhaps one of the biggest users of the court system and the judiciary are lawyers. Right. But from the very parties who employ the lawyers to work for them. So the lawyers are such a key part of this. And in fact, they themselves have been doing something of their own. The Chief Justice announced today that the Ghana Bar Association has adopted a new process where they are going to equip all courts across the country with chairs and tables. And they call it one lawyer, one chair, one mm. lawyer, one table. So that when lawyers... Is that sometimes lawyers go to court... Exactly, and they don't get, they don't a, get a place a to, to sit. In fact, there are so many lawyers who have to stand behind the bar 
wait for certain lawyers who are in the bar to finish speaking. They get up and they have to go and sit down. And so the, the, the Ghana Bar Association is committing to doing this using their own resources to support the judiciary in doing this. The Chief Justice says they've signed a memorandum of understanding with the GBA and that, proves, that, 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 that event is being implemented. But on the specific call of this new vision, mm. the president of the Bar Association, um, Yawa Champo Bwafu, says it's a laudable idea that the Chief Justice is bringing together such a laudable project to be implemented. They are going to support the Chief Justice every step of the way. They have a recommendation to the government through the finance ministry mm. that whatever it is that the, the, the judiciary is able to collect in terms of IGF mm. should be retained 100% by the judiciary. We know that all state institutions that do any business that retain some IGF would have to give a part of that to the, the state through the finance ministry. And the, the, the GBA position now is that the, the, the judiciary, because of the work they need to do, because of the kind of investment they need to do to bring courts across the country up to par, need to be able to retain all their IGF. And it's something that he thinks the government should really consider. We at the Ghana Bar Association have no doubt about the capacity of the leadership to bring real leadership to the judiciary and in the administration of justice in Ghana. It is instructive to state her leadership is leading the judiciary at a very critical and significant stage in our country, a stage where there is more awareness among the people from whom justice emanates about their rights and expectations of propriety and more integrity from our judges and staff of the judicial service and an equal demand from the citizenry for more accountability and efficiency of the judiciary. It's also a stage that has also witnessed one of the most remarkable and bold efforts at infrastructure developments that has led to the building of new modern court buildings and bungalows at the different levels of the judiciary, largely the, pro the product of the vision of recent past Chief Justice of the Republic. Equally, it is a stage of enhanced recognition for an adoption of technology in the operations of the judiciary. King Solomon, in his impeccable wisdom, Acknowledging the book of Proverbs 29, verse, chapter 29, verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. A vision for any institution, especially for an important one such as the judiciary, is that is, that's crucial and invigorating. As the head and leader of the judiciary, her leadership is its embodiment. She provides a drive and direction, and in my humble view, the judiciary is propelled by the vision of the Chief Justice, around which human and financial resources are mobilized to achieve the ends of that vision. It is our hope that it will be a vision that will be transformative. And that was the president of the Ghana Bar Association, Yao Echampon Buafo. And we're going to have, we're going to expand this. We're going to explore the issues raised by the chief justice, the attorney general, the vice president, the Ghana Bar Association, in subsequent bulletins on Top Story on Joy 99.7 FM, and of course on Joy News Prime. But for now, let's talk about HIV and AIDS because a coalition of civil society organizations, networks in HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria is mounting uh, pressure on government to immediately facilitate a clearance of health commodities donated by the Global Fund, valued at over $40 million, currently stranded at the Thermal Port for almost a year. These commodities include antiretroviral drugs, insecticide treated nurse, rapid diagnosis test kit. Uh, cartridges and other and others. Addressing a news conference this morning in Accra, spokesperson for the CSOs and president of the Ghana HIV and AIDS Network, Ennis Amwaben Austin, said the government lackadaisical approach towards the clearance of these goods spells a looming health disaster for the country if the government does not act now. The leadership of the coalition of CSO networks in HIV, TB and malaria wish to bring to the attention of the media and the general public our intention to present a petition to the presidency and parliament on the continued lockup of global fund donated health commodities at Temaport. The commodities in reference valued at more than $40 million have been wasting away at the port since May 2023. They comprise antiretrovirals for treatment of HIV, medications for treatment of TB, ACTs 
for treatment of malaria, insecticide treated nets, rapid diagnostic test kits, and gene expert cartridges, among others. The situation has currently created stockouts in health facilities across the country, leading to needless loss of lives and frustration for health workers. The essence of our intended action, therefore, is to draw the attention of the presidency and parliament to the looming public health emergency if no immediate actions are taken on the matter. As a background, we would like to point out that the Global Fund has since 2002 supported Ghana's national response against HIV and AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria to the tune of more than $1.2 billion. These funds are made available to the country in cycles of three years. For example, for Grand Cycle 6, which was implemented between 2021 and 2023, Global Fund supported the country with more than $250 million. For Grand Cycle 7, which is to be implemented between 2024 and 2026, the Global Fund has earmarked about $248 million for the country. Between May and August 2023, Global Fund, as part of its commitment to GC7, shipped HIV and AIDS and TB and malaria commodities worth about $40 million into the country. In line with regular practice, Global Fund made available 400,000 US dollars, being 1% of the value of the commodities to cover procurement and supply management costs. Right, so what really is the problem here? Spokesperson for the CSOs and president of the Ghana HIV and AIDS Network, Ernest Amwabe Otsen, joins me via Zoom. Mr. Oxen, you're welcome to the polls. I'm sure you've been checking on this matter. What really is preventing the clearance of the, the drugs at the port? Because my understanding is that uh, these are donations, and for that reason, it shouldn't go to the challenge it is going through. Yes, um, a very good afternoon to you, and that's your US as well. Uh, indeed, this issue is a mind-boggling one. Mm. Um, we have commodities which have been donated by the Global Fund, worth more than $40 million. And our government, all that they're supposed to do is to clear these commodities so that they'll be made available in health facilities for treatment of our competitors. However, for more than a year, these commodities have been stuck at the ports. And we have been pulling up with the Ministry of Health um, for a very long time now. We have been giving assurances that the commodities will be cleared. But each time a deadline is given, um, they fail to meet the deadline. So today, we felt we've had enough uh, because we are aware that antiretrovirals in the country will be running out next month. And that is going to be a very serious public health emergency because persons on HIV treatment will, will not have access to medication. And what that, that, when that happens, even when the drugs are reintroduced, these persons are going to develop a resistance against the previous medications that they were taking. And then you have to be put on second line medication, mm. which is even more expensive. So we feel that we come to the point where government um, must act on this matter. It's not only HIV and AIDS products, we have um, TB medications as well. We also have treated insecticide uh, nets and um, other cartridges and other commodities which are relying at the point. I just want to find million. out. I just want to find out. This is clearly a matter that should be resolved between the Ministry of Finance and maybe GRA. 
Uh, I don't know whether you, you, you probed into this aspect and what vibe are you getting? Because clearly, somebody must write to GRA and say that let these goods be cleared. So our understanding is that that kind of engagement has already taken place. And the GRA was saying that the Parliament of Ghana failed to make some waivers, mm. um, three specific waivers. Um, AU um, levy, ECOWAS levy, and then COVID-19 um, recovery levy. Mm. These three levies were not waived by Parliament. So it meant that Global Fund needed to pay for those levies. And then it also happened that these commodities came in at a time when we had increased our port um, charges. And so what was initially made available was insufficient for the clearance of the goods. So according to the Ministry of Health, that is what was causing the delay. Um, the levies not being waived by Parliament, mm. so meaning they had to be paid, and then increments in the port charges. So instead of the original $400,000 um, that the Global Fund made available, government was asking for $3.6 million before the goods could be cleared. And, it, and, 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 and if you want to simplify it, these are drugs meant for the government of Ghana, isn't it? Exactly so. And the same government of Ghana is frustrating the clearing of these goods. That, that, is, that is a mystery. That is a mystery surrounding this whole issue. Because as we speak, as I mentioned, these commodities have run out in our health facilities. Mm. So it's really mind-boggling why we continue to hold on to these commodities in the ports. So beyond the, beyond the news conference, what more are you, are you, are you planning to do uh, to get this matter resolved? Well, fortunately, um, this morning before the press conference, um, we had um, a visit by the new Commissioner General of the Ghana Revenue Authority mm. in the person of uh, Madame Julie Essiam. Um, she came in and she held a meeting with the leadership and um, she indicated that she is a new Commissioner General and uh, she's coming to office um, at a time when the Finance Minister also has a new uh, Minister designate. And um, there are, in fact, there are lots of new persons around the table now. The Health Ministry also has a, a, a new Health Minister designate. Who, who and is so, to be sworn in. Um, the issue has not come to their attention and they want to intervene. So uh, she has asked us to give her maximum 14 days and the first batch will be cleared this very week mm. and then the second batch will be cleared finally um, in 14 days. So we have indicated to her that we are ready to cooperate with her to get these goods um, cleared. But nevertheless, we are still going on with our course of action which is one, to present a petition to, to the presidency and then to parliament. Um, just this afternoon, we began the process. We've sent a letter to the Accra Regional Police Command um, in notifying them of our intention to have this uh, demonstration or petition uh, sent to the presidency and to parliament. We are going to collect signatures from people around the country so that they will understand that if they, if they go to health facilities and they don't find these commodities, mm. it is because they are held at the ports. So that together, they can join us in bringing pressure on government to bear on this matter. So that assurance you got that uh, from the GRA, that they are working to ensure that by next week, we will have the first clearance. Does it mean that they will sidestep the parliamentary process to have this thing addressed? Well, um, according to the GRA Commissioner um, General, Mr. Austin's line is breaking. And uh, yes, please go on. To work with everybody recognizes that this is an emergency. Mm. So whatever uh, we have to do to get a boost out, they are going to do that. And we are giving her the benefit of the doubt. But nevertheless, because of previous assurances that we had, and failure of sin, we have decided to go on with our processes 
until we see the goods cleared from the ports. We have indicated to her mm. that when they are ready for the first levels, the media should be invited. We ourselves should be invited so that we all see the commodities being cleared. Then everyone will be satisfied that indeed the process has begun. Mr. Oxen, my final question will be, in the absence of this, whilst we battle the legalities to get the goods out of the, of the Thermopod, for those, on, those who are relying on the antiretroviral drugs and those who are looking forward to their TB and malaria drugs, what danger are they in? Yes, as I mentioned, when you are on medication for um, HIV, for example, and you go off that medication for some period of time, mm. when you resume your medication, that same medication will not work for you because you have developed a resistance for that medication. And, 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 so, and that is you exposing yourself to reaching the HIV status, the A status. Exactly so. The A status. Exactly so, because exactly so. Once, once you are able to get this medication, this life-saving medication, then you are predisposing yourself um, you know, towards um, you know, getting opportunistic infections and all of that. Mm. And for TB, the treatment is such that if you go off treatment for a very short while, you could just lose your life. Your life. And we are having reports of such cases um, around the country. Mm. We are entering the rainy season. We are supposed to be distributing um, bed nets to pregnant mothers and um, children under five and so on and so forth. But these commodities are not available in our health facilities. Mm. Rather, they are stuck at the ports. You know, a very mind-boggling situation. It is. And so we, we, that's why we are asking um, that government um, you know, invokes all emergency powers for forever to get these commodities cleared. I want to thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Mr. Uh, Oxen uh, leads some civil society groups that are working to ensure that the HIV drugs, the tuberculosis drugs, and malaria drugs already uh, that are held up at the Timber Port are released. This is your election headquarters. <music>
for the Ejusu constituency. Kwabena Boatin will be first on the ballot paper. Because I picked one. And I think that is also quite profound. Um, looking at the work I have done. Dr. Evan Spear, who will show second on the paper, links this to the former MP, John Kuma, who he believes will remain the number one option for the constituency. Dr. Jonah Pontio Kuma. And uh, today, His Excellency Dr. Mahmoud Baumia was also number two. I think we all know what number two means from the two names that I've mentioned. It's simply a two sure number that signifies that we are going to win this election. Interestingly, Clansman Kakari Mensa links his third position to the performance of former Black Stars striker Asamoah Jan. You know the Asamoja, you know Baby Jet, and you know how he strike hard for Ghana. And um, I'm also, I've also been in football before, and um, I'm very good in scoring. So getting number three now, I know how to do the machinations of passing to get the goal. For the presiding member of the Ejusu Municipal Assembly, Helena Mensa, the positioning does little to the advantage of the candidates. And me, I'm okay with the numbers. Every number is a lucky number, so I don't. It's 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 okay. And when you count, you started from the men, one, two, three, four. I'm the first person, a lady, number four. So that one, they can leave the men, the three men, and come to number four and vote for me. The fifth attempt, being made by Abuna Pokria Amuabuaite, reflected at her fifth position. Another female candidate, Portia Bafo Abronye, steps into the sixth position, probably. The most popular among the candidates, Kwesi Nyantechi, thinks picking his favorite seventh position is divine. I had indicated to you all on the day uh, I submitted the form that I was the Cristiano Ronaldo of Ejiso. And God has perfected it by ensuring that I picked number seven. Any football fan anywhere in the world knows that the trademark for Cristiano Ronaldo is number seven. And so the number seven jersey number I took represents my brilliance, eloquence, hard work, and excellence in football uh, as we transfer it to politics. Aaron Prince Bia is claiming to be the one restoring love to the party with the eighth position. Number eight, what it means is love. I just, we've lost the love for the party. So, Honorable Aaron is bringing the love for MPP. Those who have departed, they are all coming back because of the love I'm bringing. Mamiya Abwaje, to some supporters, will be easily located as the last candidate on the ballot paper. For joining us, Nanaya Ojima, Let's do some banking stories before we go because a new study has revealed that some commercial banks in Ghana could face liquidity issues with their new cash reserve requirements placed on them by the Bank of Ghana. The research comes after the central bank decided to raise the amount of cash reserve it expects from banks. According to the study, this situation could limit credit to the private sector and ultimately uh, result in a collapse, merger and acquisition of commercial banks as a measure to safeguard depositors. Thankfully. Uh, We've been joined by two researchers who came together with these findings. Dr. Rich Simon, the two are is banking consultant and co-author. This would join his lead data and research analyst, Isaac Kofi AJ. Let me start with you, Kofi. So, Kofi, run us through your findings. So, first of all, I will speak about uh, what we looked at before we actually decided to embark on this study. Mm. And so, we've been looking at three key data um, you know, sets that inform this decision. So, first one has to do with the non-performing you know, loans that commercial banks currently have, mm. which, have which has moved from 15% to now 24.6%. And then also the activities of the central bank uh, in the treasury bill market that has actually priced out a lot of private sector uh, from this space. 
And then the fact that these same commercial banks that the Bank of Ghana is placing such high cash reserve requirements on them are the same banks that sacrificed uh, during the DDP program where they sacrificed close to you know, 50.6 billion Ghana CDs of bonds uh, that they bond. Most of them were depositors' money. So we decided to check the liquidity positions of these banks to see uh, how the current requirements from the, world, the Bank of Ghana is going to affect them uh, in their liquidity position. So I'm sure Doc has a lot right. to talk about it mm. and, and we'll go into the findings of, of the research. So let me bring it to you. Dr. Chuanghene, what exactly is this cash reserve ratio that commercial banks have to meet? And what, what is the danger here if they are unable to meet it? Thank you very much. Um, it's been a, it's a monetary tool which has been used ever since independence. Mm. Yes, it's a, it's a policy. It's one of the monetary tools used by central banks to control inflation and stem up depreciation of currency. Ghana has used it over the years, even during Chroma time. The 19, 1988 financial sector reform, then where it was changed that we should come out from direct controls and come from indirect monetary policy control. All that it means is that banks are required to hold cash with the central bank for say 100 cities you keep 15 percent no interest is paid on it mm. so if you lift it up you increase it to a 25 percent so for every 100 cities the banks will have 25 cities locked up with central bank where interest is not even paid meanwhile you would have paid interest before you got the deposit right but because it's a practice global practices Lot, a lot of banks don't complain. And, and because of that, in other jurisdictions, like in Europe, you keep minimal, say 5%. But here, because inflation is always ahead of us, banks use it, uh, government, the central bank use higher rates to control inflation. And again, at the same time, to stem the depreciation, to, to stop the depreciation of the currency. The recent one, what makes the, that recent one a bit quite interesting is that the banks has just come out from debt restructuring. And when we talk about the debt restructuring, the banks do not, as a bank, nobody has 150 billion deposit, mm. which they used in buying the bonds. It was the customer deposit, which was used in buying the bonds. And the bonds were restructured. And the last payment will come in 2031. So if you add the restructured bond 50 billion to the total deposit of 224 billion, then it means that you are doing double counting. What right. we are saying is that governor should have taken the deposit that has already been restructured mm. out of this and then do say one the, with the 180 billion. But unfortunately, they just loaded them on the banks. And what it means is that the banks are going to have a little space to give credit and the governor himself said that credit has declined by 29%. And at the same time, he was blaming the banks that why haven't they gone to give credit? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the other side of the equation is that the non-performing, which is the banks, the banks are experiencing recovery problem. And it has jumped from 15% to 24% within a space of 18 months. And the people take loans so, and they don't pay back. It's, it's, yeah, they don't, it's not them, it's not their fault. If you look at the last 18 months, the current economic challenges, higher inflation, persistent depreciation of currency, myriad of new, new sun taxes, uh, call it higher utility bills, higher fuel, higher labor costs, all these things dovetail into non-performing. But if you are looking at it, you may say that the banks are lazy, but the economic environment in which the banks find themselves now is not conducive. Right. And let me give you one let me give you one example. Right. 206, 207, I think 207, 206 to 8. Do you know that the banks had to go and plead with people to come and take car loans? Consumer loan was as cheap as 10%. <laughs> I, I, Consumer I, I, loan was I, as cheap I, as 10%. I remember. I remember. The banks were taking ah. people to take loans. Yes. But what we have now, even the loans that you have, you're not able to recover because of the exogenous factors which I have already mentioned. Mm. So the banks decided that if we're not going to build loans and we're taking deposit, which will pay interest, why don't we go and buy treasury bill? 
And for goodness sake, it is you, the same government, who has created the enabling environment for lucrative treasury bills. So the bank decided to do what in banking we call lazy banking approach. Basically, go and buy treasury bill and have no problem with recovery. And then when you sat down there, you say, look, the people are buying too many treasury bills. Having forgotten that it is the government and you, the financial finance ministry, who have created the enabling environment. Now, having blocked their debt, mm. having refused to pay their bonds, mm. now you're telling them that you are also going to put a higher uh, in, uh, in non-interest non bearing reserves. They are suffering from interest losses because no customer will give you a deposit without a, a, an interest. And again, you have destroyed the bonds. Over, I mean, it has never happened anywhere. I mean, it has had domestic bonds, not, I don't know which country, maybe I think Jamaica and uh, Ukraine and Russia some time ago did to the domestic bank. We have done something which is quite extraordinary. All right. And even that, sorry to say, and even that, the debt is rather increasing. The recent public figures came. We have jumped from 548 to 610 billion. So even the debt restructuring has not actually reduced the debt as such. All right. So uh, you want to destroy the banks. That's what that we are saying. But I'm sure we'll have more time to discuss this matter because of time. Kofi, yeah. final words on this matter, and then we can, we, 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 we'll, we'll have time to go into the Nikki. I mean, I mean looking, at, looking at the current problem that we have, if we say that we are using the current monetary policy tools to fight inflation, it's just like antibiotics. When you keep taking them, your body builds a certain resistance. immunity or resistance to it. That's the same thing happening in our economy where we've kept using these monetary policy tools to fight problems that are basically fiscal. So we are recommending that the banks or the, the central banks should go ahead and do additional, you know, 30% cuts in their expenditure. They should look closely at the fiscal policy and, and, and you know, leave the banks to have a breathing space because they just went through a debt restructure. They've not fully recovered yet and they cannot take this huge um, cash requ requirements that Bank of Ghana is trying to place on the melting. All right, I'm sure there'll be more on this on Joy Business and of course on News Night and Joy News Prime. But that's our show for today. For more stories, log on to our website, myjoyonline.com. Stories, ECG will issue Dooms or Timetable soon. That's according to Atachi, our chairman of the uh, Parliamentary Co Committee on Mines and Energy. We have moved from taxation to robbery. That's former Auditor General Daniel Demelevo. My name is Elton Brobe. Tomorrow, same time, 3 p.m. to 5, we'll be here with another exciting edition of The Pulse. Have a good evening and take care. Whatever you're up to in the hours ahead, I hope it's profitable.